today we're celebrating Palm Sunday. So I want to start by reading the excerpt from the Bible regarding this event. And this is from the book of Luke, chapter 19. And we're going to pick it up from verse 28. After telling this story, Jesus went on towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. Don't you love that? Mm -hmm. Go into the parking lot. Choose any car you like. And if anyone asks, why are you driving away in that porch? Just say, the Lord needs it. Okay. Well, obviously, God has probably provided a revelation to the owner of the cult, saying, tie it here. And if anyone asks, if anyone unties it, ask them why. And if they say the Lord needs it, don't bother them and don't press charges. <laughs> so they went ahead, found the colt, just as Jesus had said, and sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. <clears throat> When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, if they kept quiet, the stones themselves along the road would burst into cheers. Just as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side, and they will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. After that, he taught daily in the temple, but the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the other leaders of the people began planning on how to kill him. But they could think of nothing because all the people hung on his every word. So there's a lot of content in that chapter. I just want to go through it the best I can and make um, hopefully some pertinent points that we can use for our own lives today. First of all, it's a bittersweet moment. Jesus is welcomed into the city of Jerusalem by apparently large crowds of people cheering him. And yet, it's a bitter day because Jesus knows, as we study the divine principle, we find out what Jesus had been trying to do unsuccessfully until then is build a foundation for him to stand on as the Messiah. And um, <clears throat> due largely 
to the failure of John the Baptist to recognize the Messiah as being his own cousin, his own half-brother, Jesus was not able to build that foundation. And so he knew there was a 99% chance that he was going to be crucified, that he was going to be executed. So it's a bittersweet moment. There's an opportunity for disciples to rally around him and to create enough of a condition for him to be protected, but the chances are, based upon recent history, that that is not going to happen. And Jesus knows that. He's fully aware as he's going into Jerusalem. He's not swayed by the throngs of people that are welcoming him. Uh, he's, not, uh, he's not for any moment assured that things are going to be sweet and rosy for him. So he weeps because he takes no pleasure in what's going to happen to the chosen people after they've done this act of not recognizing their own Messiah. So he weeps for them. So in a sense, Jesus was, on this Palm Sunday that we celebrate, he was preparing for his own death. He was a wanted man. He knew that he was basically a wanted man. And what did he do? He goes to the temple and he stirs up a hornet's nest. Because he had been into the temple earlier, this was the second time he had had to go in there and clean things up. The first time he fashioned his own whip and went in there and beat people up, moved them out of the way. Second time, he goes in there and he starts throwing tables over. That'll get your attention. Imagine you're in a restaurant, you're eating, and everything's comfortable and cozy, and some guy comes in and throws the table over. You're like, oh! <laughs> Jesus was a powerful dude, by any accounts. There was one story in the Bible where there was a group or a throng of people that were ready to beat him up. And in the Bible, it simply says, he made his way through them. You know, there's a group of people that are getting ready to beat you up, beat you to a pulp. Can you imagine the scene? And you make your way through them. Excuse me. You went, excuse me. Yeah. No, how do you think he made his way through them? By all accounts, he beat the living daylights out of these people. And the other ones were like, I'm not going to mess with him. And then they let him go. He made his way through them. He was a big, strong guy. And yet he describes himself in Matthew 11:29 as meek and lowly in heart. Meek. Jesus. So people have taken that word and think, oh yeah, Jesus. And they portrayed him in this golden flowery locks of hair with a lamb over his shoulder. I'm meek, I'm Jesus. <coughs> I'm not making fun of Jesus. I'm simply making fun of the portrayal that some people have of Jesus. He was a burly guy. He was a tough dude. Okay? He made his way through throngs of antagonistic people. Now, what is the definition of meek in this sense? It is restrained power. For instance, if you are a heavyweight boxer, and you go to the beach and some guy starts messing around um, you know annoying you or your wife and you decide I'm not going to punch this guy to the ground I'm simply going to tell him to stop and then walk away that is meekness that is restrained power that is the opportunity to do some serious damage to another human being and deciding I will restrain myself. And that is the kind of powerful person that Jesus was. Occasionally we see him unleash that power. Why? Why was Jesus angry? Jesus was angry. Okay, actually, let me get back to that. First of all, let's talk about why were the crowds 
pretty much we can assume that some of the people, or maybe a lot of the people that were welcoming Jesus into the city of Jerusalem, five days later, were the same people chanting for his crucifixion. What happened in those five days? Well, we go back to Jesus said some things earlier in his ministry, such as, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it back in three days. And of course he was referring to his own physical body. And yet that was interpreted by some people as being the temple, the sacred temple that the Jews held so dearly. And anyone threatening destruction of the temple, that was a heinous crime. And so, by twisting the words that Jesus spoke, the leaders, the celebrities of the day, were able to rile people up in antagonism towards Jesus, which was a shame. And we see that kind of happening today as well. I mean, we're not that much different. We hear some news of some celebrity or some politician saying something, it gets twisted by the media and then all of a sudden everybody's upset because everything's out of context. And we fall into the same trap. We get easily persuaded because we don't know the truth. So it was no different for the Jewish people. Their leaders were very upset with Jesus. Why? Because they had a good thing going. You know, this whole um, racket going on inside the temple, where you come to the temple to make an offering, and then you get told, I'm sorry, the lamb you brought, it's not grade A material, but I can help you out. I have a lamb over here. It's only $30,000. And if you make an offering with this lamb, you are sure to get blessed. So what do you want to do? And so this kind of racket, you can imagine this kind of racket going on, and I'm sure the people who ran the temple were part of it. And Jesus comes in and says, this is no good. Get this out of here. This is my father's house. You know, you are blocking people from coming back to God. And what is the Messiah's prime mission? to bring people back to God. This is a direct assault on the purpose of the Messiah coming to the earth. This is the, a direct assault on God's providence of restoration. And that is why Jesus was angry. <clears throat> Recently we had this tragedy of a mudslide, a massive mudslide in a South American country. I think it was Guatemala. And I saw this picture of this, uh, this mother who had uh, relatives, her own children I believe, trapped inside this building that was covered in mud. And she was like clawing at the mud with tears and mud on her face, just desperately clawing. And bystanders looking at her and trying to help her and just, you know, unconsolable, unconsolable tragedy. And as I looked at that, and as I thought about it later, I could imagine that is the desperation that God has in His heart to reach His children. So that image stuck with me. And... When I heard, when I read about Jesus, his anger going into the temple, seeing how people supposedly hired by the top gurus of the day were blocking people from coming back to God, and how that angered and frustrated him to no end. So, Jesus was doing the right thing. And yet, when you do the right thing in this fallen world, and you disrupt 
the mafia of the time, you are now a wanted man. You now have a price on your head because you are disrupting the status quo. People don't like it. When drug cartels are disrupted, they come back and they have these huge recriminatory killing sessions. This happens today. Back in those days, Jesus was a wanted man. And so he knew that. They couldn't get to him whilst he was being surrounded by crowds of people listening and hanging on his every word. So they had to wait for an opportune moment in order to grab him and arrest him. And that took place a few days later. So, and we know what happened after that. So let's ask ourselves this. Jesus had cleaned up the temple before. And then for a while, things were okay. But then, you know, after a while, some other guy comes and sets up his table, looks around. Hmm, nobody's coming to get me out. Other people see him, go, oh, I'm going to set up my table too. Plonk. Before you know it, everybody's back doing their thing in the temple again. And Jesus comes back, clears them out, upsets the status quo, the leadership, and uh, they all want him dead. And people are like, what? This is not right. But it needed cleaning. Have you ever been to someone's house in the middle of a spring clean? Have you ever stepped back and looked at your own house while you're in the middle of a spring clean? It's chaotic. There's stuff everywhere. It looks even worse than when you started. But you're in the middle of a cleaning session. And how many times do we need to clean? How many times? I mean, I have a tendency to get things uh, built up on my desk piling things up, and then eventually, once every six months, I decide, you know what, I don't think I need this on my desk anymore, and I don't think I need that, I don't think I need that, and I go into this huge clean-up session, and then everything's okay for that day. But then, the next day, what am I going to do with this mail? I don't know, put it there. How about this thing? I don't know. I found this over here. Um, okay, just put it there. And before long, I'm back with a mess. When Jesus taught us how to pray, he said, he taught us how to ask forgiveness for our sins. And that's important because how often do you sin? I think I probably sinned already this morning. If I'm really honest with myself, Somewhere in my thoughts, in my mind, in my attitude, in my thinking, maybe even in my actions or words, I'm sure. You know, we sin a lot, and therefore we need to clean ourselves a lot. We shouldn't wait till six months, or every Sunday, or we should be doing this perpetually every day. We should be cleaning all the time in order to allow God to work through us, in order for, to allow God to enter us, in order to keep tabs on our situation. As it errs, we bring it back. As we err this way, we bring it back. And we always need to be checking in with the truth. We always need to be reading the Word of God in order to clarify and purify our mind. If we think about how distracted we are in this world, it's not surprising. How much time do you spend, do I spend, watching the news? How much time do you spend, you know, listening or, you know, reciprocating with the gossip that you read on Facebook or on Twitter or on any other social media site? Versus how much time do you spend reading the Word of God? It's very easy to see why we're lost many times 
we're confused, we're suffering, we don't know how to get back, we have no real understanding, we're just going along with the flow, and then all we, you know, we have this celebrity standing up saying something, the celebrity of our day. Who are the celebrities of our day? The politicians, the movie stars, the singers. What qualification do they have on understanding the will of God? Anybody? Hey, I'm a famous actor and I'm telling you there's no God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, the crowd around Jesus was pretty fickle. The crowd around uh, politicians is also very fickle. One week later, those same people could be turning on that same politician because of something that got twisted and turned, or maybe something that really did happen. The point is that we have to be people that are not easily swayed in our faith. We have to root it on something solid, okay? I mean, we have the solid foundation in our movement of the Reverend and Mrs. Sang Myung Moon, the true parents. We have them. And right now, just as there was a, there was a movement back in the 16th century to clean up the Catholic Church, I believe similar movements are happening today in our movement, in our church. I don't worry as much as I used to about such movements. I think, when I think of my brothers and sisters who are in different camps in our church, I don't doubt their sincerity. I believe they, they believe they're doing exactly the right thing. And I believe we all want the same thing. And I believe that the mountain, as Buddha said, doesn't mind which way it is climbed. I believe competition in the marketplace is a good thing. I believe that if we're all in competition with each other, then let's have a competition of love. And whoever wins the game of love benefits all people. So let's game on. Let's do it. You have a better way? You think that's a better way? Go, go for it. Love the evil out of this world. Do it the best way you think you can. You think you have a better way? Great, go for it. I'm going to stay over here because I think this is the right way. But that's okay. I love you and I hope you love me too. But if not, I'm sorry. <laughs> I used to worry and get concerned about the fact that people didn't believe what I believed in. And now, when I go onto YouTube and I see atheists debate, I feel very happy, actually. Because I see their point. And I also detect there's some pain behind their words and behind their worldview. And I realize, yeah, these are good people trying to do the right thing. Whether it is or not, who's, what's for me to judge? I'm simply doing the same thing. I'm doing what I think is the right thing. And we always have to clean ourselves, and we always have to check ourselves. And if we are true, in what we are doing. We should not be afraid of what other people are doing. Because people can come against you, people can revile you, people can hate you, people can stamp on you, people can try to convince you. But if you are really true, at the end of it all, there you are. This is exactly what happened to Jesus. They reviled him, they hated him, they crucified him, they stomped on him, they tried to crush his memory, and in the end, this wretched man who is put to death 
in this postage stamp sized country in the corner of the world, instead of being forgotten, changed human history. And that is the power of truth. So don't be afraid of what other people are doing and don't necessarily criticize them because unless you have a direct line with God, <laughs> you don't necessarily know that you're speaking the truth either. There's this uh, product they sell in England called Horlicks. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. It's a malted milk. It's a, it's a powder you put in your drink and you mix it up and you drink it. In England, it's advertised as a nighttime drink. You drink your cup of Horlicks and then you fall asleep. And it's really good for relaxing you and making you go to sleep. And guess what? In India, they sell exactly the same product. And do you know what they market it as? Get up and go! Yeah! It's going to make you taller, stronger, smarter! And it's advertised as a breakfast time drink. The same product, exactly the same formula, marketed in two completely different ways. Which one is true? It's a rhetor rhetoric question, <laughs> and you know the answer, they're both right! I don't know if they're both right, they couldn't be both wrong! I don't know, I'm not a scientist, maybe if I was I'd go like, well, let's take a look at this, does it really make you smarter? Mm, uh, questionable. Um, the point is, we just have to be humble in heart, we have to check ourselves with the truth, we have to keep on going back again and again to God and asking forgiveness. We have to be practicing love in our daily life to expand our heart, expand our mind. And we have to be always forgiving others. Why? So that we can forgive ourselves when we screw up. Because we're constantly screwing up. Constantly. And the reason, if you don't think that you're screwing up, it's because you're judging other people and one day that judgment does a boomerang and comes right back and smacks you in the back of the head. That was a Sherlock Holmes uh, mystery on one of the series. Did anyone see that one? <laughs> this guy dies in the middle of a field and nobody knows why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Turns out that he was throwing a boomerang and then there was a car up the hill that backfired and made a booming sound. The guy turns around, and just as he turns around to see what the booming sound was, the boomerang smacks him on the back of the head and kills him. <laughs> and that was the mystery. <laughs> but that's what happens to your judgment. It'll kill you. So stop it. Just, you have enough stuff going on inside of here to deal with for a lifetime. So stop worrying about other people's stuff, as Jesus said. Take the log out of your own eye first before you start poking or trying to get the splinter out of other people's. So in, on this Palm Sunday, this bittersweet moment where Jesus was both welcomed and reviled at the same time, that he was both welcomed by the crowd and yet knew the path he was walking was towards the spiritual salvation for humanity in which he was going to offer his life. Let us look at ourselves. Let us find ways in which we can repent in front of God that we can make a plan to read God's Word every day, to check ourselves against, so that we can truly anchor ourselves in this world and not be blown this way or that way by political winds or movie stars or celebrities or gossip of any kind, but rather we anchor ourselves in the truth and we forgive those who trespass against us in the hope that one day when we realize how much we hurt other people's feelings, 
that we will be forgiven as well. Let us have that kind of celebration of Jesus' achievement. Let us think about what he has done for us and how we can do so much for the people around us and for our own posterity in the same way. Please join me in prayer. Our heavenly parents, thank you so much for your love and your undying devotion to your children. We understand that you've been desperate to reconnect with us ever since the fall. And you even sent your son Jesus into the world to try to reconnect your children back to you. <coughs> Jesus was so desperate to do that, and he was so desperate he was even willing to throw his own life in front of the oncoming doom that was heading towards all of us in order to change the direction of history and turn it towards you. Heavenly parents, we have so much to be thankful for, to Jesus, and for all the saints and sages of history. We have so much to be thankful for, for the founder of this movement. We have so much to be thankful for, for so many people in our own lives who are helping us to clean ourselves, who are helping us to be truthful. And we hope that just like Jesus resurrected from his situation, that we can resurrect our own spiritual life by repentance and making a commitment to you at this time. We offer this prayer thankfully in the name James and Katya Chisholm. We're a blessed central family, and in Jesus' name, in Christ's name, 